Right. I've just initiated the recording. Uh, maybe whilst we're waiting for others, let's just have some verbal greetings. Tapiwa, how are you doing? Hey, Tapiwa, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Good evening, sir. Good evening. How are you doing? I'm doing great, thank you. On a scale of one to 10, where 10, you're perfect, you're fine, couldn't be better, you're on cloud nine, and one, everything is going wrong. Where are you? What number would you give in terms of how you're feeling right now? Okay, maybe the people didn't get the question. Faith. Please unmute, talk to us. How are you, Faith? Hi, Jonah, how are you doing? Excellent, wonderful, and fantastic. On a scale of one to 10. Hey, this, this uh, camera is exaggerating just how dark I am. I'm trying to put on a light, but still, I look really dark. Anyway, on a scale of one to 10, Faith, how are you feeling? Jonah, it's okay to be dark, we are Africans. On a scale <laughs> from one to 10, I would say 9.5. Oh, oh fantastic. Fantastic. That is brilliant. Vimbai, talk to us. How are you, Vimbai? Vimbai, Priscilla, Monodawapa. I am all right. On a scale of one to ten? Stuck in a traffic jam. Oh no! Can you hear me? I can hear you. <laughs> the sound is not very good, but still I can hear you. I'm sorry that you're stuck in a traffic jam. Oh my word! I hope you don't lose connectivity. Where are you? Where are you sitting? All right. Uh, looks like. Uh... And my nitric actually seems to be dropping as well. Okay, but now we had you, we had that point. All right, fine. So on a scale of one to 10, you said, where are you? All right, let's hear from somebody else. Who else can share with us? Uh, Tapiwa, you are not given us on a scale of one to 10. How are you feeling? Um, I feel great. Um, out of 10, I'll give it a nine out of 10. Hello. Okay, thank you very much, Tapio. Can you hear me? I'm just uh, handling a call now. There's some parents who are struggling to connect. Let me just see what we can do. Okay. Just give me a moment. I'll play the music in the, in the meantime. Just give me a couple of minutes. I'm trying to make sure the other parents join, okay? Right, great. Thanks to those who have just joined us. I think we've managed to address the challenge that was presented, preventing uh, some of the parents from joining. So welcome to you parents who have just joined. Uh, we are now starting the session. We are recording the session so that um, you can have this to refer to uh, at your own leisure. Uh, I would like to call upon anybody who feels moved by the spirit to give us an opening prayer. Who would like to pray for us? Waiting for a volunteer. Let us pray. Thank you, Rati. Dear Heavenly Father, we bless your name tonight, oh God. Father, we thank you even as we are able to come together, Father, and just learn, Father. Father, we open our hearts and our minds to receive, Father, that we may be able to use whatever we learn tonight into practice. Father, we pray even for the children that we have gathered together to deliberate over that, Father God, you just continue to be with them. May you minister to them, Father, and may they know you. Father, we pray that tonight will be life-changing and that, Father, you enable us as parents, give us wisdom, my God, in the in way to go even for facilitators. We pray for wisdom. We pray for power from on high. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 
Amen. Thank you very much. We greatly appreciate that, that word of prayer. Always, always appreciated, at least in our workshops. Right. So um, I'm Jonah Mungoshi. You already know Tafadzwa, Coach Tafadzwa. You're familiar with them. Uh, you are, I assume most of you, if not all, are members of Teen TED. So you're familiar with our programs. If you're not, um, suffice to say, we run programs for teenagers, for preteens, uh, and for young adults. And uh, the person who leads that initiative from our side, from Flood Tide Investments, is Coach Tafazwa. And Teen TED is actually a platform for parents, free of charge, sharing information about parenthood and about raising their children and just giving them insight since we work a lot with children. So today, Tafazwa is helping me in the background. Uh, I'm facilitating this session. I already sent you a quick introduction on the WhatsApp group because I didn't want us to take too long. I wanted us to get straight into the gist of what we are gathered here to do today, which is really talking about motivating your child for academic excellence. So before we go any further, I just want to emphasize that this is a conversation we are having. It is not a monologue. You are not here to just listen to me, but you are here to also share your views, your understanding. We are here to exchange uh, ideas so that at the end of the day, we are all enriched. I would actually be very happy if some of you learn more from each other than you even learn from me, because we are all parents are uh, sharing our experiences and helping each other uh, discharge this God-given mammoth task of uh, sending into the future an important influence, because whatever you do with your children uh, will determine the influence that they have in the world, the influence that they have on other people. And it's, um, it's a never ending cycle because they influence somebody who influences somebody who influences somebody. And you can imagine if it's, if it's good, positive influence, it will resonate throughout, throughout the, the ages till the end of time. And if it's bad, uh, it will also resonate negatively. So it is uh, an important and non-transferable responsibility that God has given us. Uh, it is a responsibility that we need to take uh, seriously. So uh, before we get started, I just want to have uh, some responses from you. And this time I'd like you to answer either in the chat here in WhatsApp or in, uh, here in, in Zoom or in the WhatsApp group. So here's the question I want you to answer. What is the most important quality that you appreciate in your child? If you have more than one child, then just more than one child, then choose one of the children and answer this in terms of that one child. What is the one quality that this child possesses that you as a parent appreciate. So I'm gonna switch off my camera now. As you can see, I'm not very photogenic, uh, but I just thought what to get started, people might want to see my face. So please type your answer. I'm giving you exactly two minutes. Uh, this is how I manage my time. Uh, exactly two minutes. And I will um, read out the answers that you're typing. And then we take it up from there. So please type, you've got an option either in the chat here in Zoom, or in WhatsApp, it's entirely up to you. All right, something has come through in the chat. Um, ah, faith says focused. Yeah, focused. Focus is such an important thing. I understand. I, I hear you, faith. Um, I've had <laughs> I have five children, and among those, there are some that are really focused. There are some that are not so focused, and you can see the value of focus. Uh, focus means somebody can concentrate on a task and see it to fruition. Uh, being unfocused means they just do all sorts of things and, and are easily distracted. Right, so it says, my son endures and perseveres. That's fantastic. Thank you very much, Ratizo. Uh, teach, your hand is raised. Please unmute and talk to us, Teach. Go ahead and say something. Teach, your microphone is muted. Ah, it's unmuted now. Go ahead, Teach. Uh, I can't hear teach. If you're speaking teach for some strange reason, we can't hear you. Maybe just type your answer either in the WhatsApp or in Zoom here. So let me read what has come through on the WhatsApp. Uh, Vimbai says, my network has failed me. So hoping to get the recording. Oh no, Vimbai, aren't you in the meeting? Ah, oh, this is so sad. 
All right, let's see who else. Elizabeth. Yeah, Elizabeth is saying, uh, Elizabeth, take care of the two kids, 12 and 19. Are you in the meeting, Elizabeth? Let me see if Elizabeth is in the meeting. Um, right, looks like Elizabeth is not yet in the meeting. Right, okay, okay. So Tafazwa, please do me a favor. Uh, ask Elizabeth to join the meeting. We're waiting for her. Uh, Vimbai should keep trying. Uh, hopefully the network will allow her in. Right, coming back to Zoom. Tapiwa says, appreciated. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. It's amazing to have a child who's appreciated. It's um, really a big test to have a child who doesn't appreciate. And for a child to develop that attitude at a young age is a really, really good thing. You should be thankful to God about that, Tapiwa. There are many parents who wish their children would be thankful. And Pauline says, caring. Pauline, you say your child is caring. Those are wonderful qualities. So as parents, I just want to encourage you to nurture, to nurture those, those qualities. Make sure you encourage them. You help those qualities to grow. All right, moving on. Thank you for your responses. I wanted to make sure we start by responding because as I say, this is an interactive session and uh, we believe in the, in the commandment, thou shall participate. So I'm expecting you to fully participate, parents. Right, this is the agenda. We started off with appreciating your child. I wanted you to focus on that appreciation because it's a foundational principle, a foundational aspect of our teachings that you need to be appreciated. About why academic excellence is important. That's the next item on our agenda. I'll just ask you to keep your microphones muted except when you're speaking. Keep your microphones muted. In fact, what I'll do is I'll just mute all for now, but you can always unmute yourselves as and when we, we need to, because there was a little bit of noise I was hearing from one microphone. So we'll talk about why academic excellence, why it's important. And then we're gonna look at some key terms and concepts, important concepts uh, that uh, inform our approach to assisting children. We'll look at what we call the triple P model. This is something that I developed uh, primarily interesting in, interestingly enough, based on my analysis of our first three children. So, uh, you know, it's amazing how God works. They are really different. They are, they're, they're in, in some respects, they're so different. And yet in those differences, I managed to understand the sources of their motivation. And it's a model I've been applying even with adults. And it's amazing how people find it resonates with them and it applies in their lives as well. We'll talk about application, how we can apply this triple M model. Uh, and then we'll have question and answer. And that'll be the end of the session, hopefully before or by 8 p.m. We don't intend to go beyond 8 p.m. So that is our agenda. That's the roadmap. And let's travel on. Starting off with why academic excellence. We define academic excellence as getting your child to perform to their full potential. Dear parents, it is important that we appreciate, we understand that not all children are gifted academically. And even when we talk of academics, how they perform in school, not all children are gifted to the same extent. This is a reality of life and we need to appreciate this. I think as a parent, you can gauge, you can assess based on the experience you've had so far with your child that at this point, my child is really doing the best that he or she can. And maybe this is the limit that they have. But we are saying on this program is we want to get your child to perform to his or her full potential or as close to that full potential as possible. That's our approach towards academic excellence. We're not saying everyone is an A grade student, no. But if your child is capable of getting a B, we want them to get that B. It is said if they achieve a C or a D, when in fact they have capacity to achieve a B. My own belief is that unless your child is a slow learner or your child is some learning disability or some psychological condition, then every child who doesn't have those 
limitations should be able to at least pass their all levels. This is what I believe. And in the years I've worked with uh, children and I've worked with parents, I've come to find this belief confirmed time and time again. I think they call it ordinary level for a reason, but there are children who can't by virtue of maybe having certain limitations, maybe they've got psychological conditions, maybe they are slow learners, uh, et cetera. I also want to emphasize the concept of deep learning. Now, take this down, this is important because it's not emphasized enough in our education system. As much as we are getting students, we're getting our learners, our children to learn and pass exams, our exams normally dwell on the surface. What are we normally looking for? The exam in most cases is looking for remembering. Do children remember the concepts that they learned? This is like regurgitation. Now, in some cases, our exams go a little bit deeper and they look at understanding. So yes, you, you remember this, but do you understand what it means? And very rarely does the learning go to the third level, which is application, applying what you have learned in different contexts. And hardly ever do we go to the, the fourth level there, which is to analyze. Analyze being able to take what you have learned and then use it to analyze different situations, different scenarios. Rarely do we use that knowledge to evaluate and do we use that knowledge to create. This is part of what I call critical thinking. And whilst the scope of critical thinking is beyond uh, the lesson we are having today, I want you to bear this in mind and have this challenge in you to say, to what extent are you helping your child beyond remembering the concepts, to understand the concepts and then to apply them? you'll find that when your child uh, achieves deep learning, it's easier for them to remember concepts. It's easier for them to apply the concepts and they are likely to perform better in exams. So I think this might be the subject of a future session, but I hope I've managed to get you interested enough in this to maybe Google it and find out a little bit more. There is a model called um, the Bloom's it's normally taught as part of teaching theory. The training teachers bloom taxonomy. And uh, it talks about this. So I don't want to go in depth into it, but please be curious enough, find out a bit more, and do what you can to help your child to learn deeper beyond merely remembering, to go into understanding and applying. And there are concepts that can be applied. But suffice to say, as of this point, I want to introduce that term to you deep learning. So having talked about our concept of academic excellence, that is getting the child to perform to their full potential, and also having shared with you something possibly new to you on deep learning about getting children to learn, not just to pass exams, but to be able to understand, apply, analyze, evaluate, and create. Let's talk about why academic excellence matters. Number one, it opens doors. Uh, we are still living in a world where that academic qualification is an initial first step in people considering you in many areas in life, whether it be job application, whether it be partnering for uh, entrepreneurship, et cetera. Having that qualification opens doors. Even if your children want to go and uh, emigrate to another country and go there not as an economic refugee, but as, as a world citizen with their own rights, you find when they've got academic qualifications, it opens doors. We want to expose children to opportunities and academic qualifications help to create more opportunities for you. Your opportunities are limited to the extent that you don't have that paperwork. So it is important and we need to share this with our children. It provides you with choices. You have a whole vista, a whole array of different choices that are open to you in terms of your profession, your vocation, your calling, uh, whatever you want to do in the world, doors are open, choices are available when you have got academic qualifications. And uh, it helps you create impact. 
your ability to create impact, to positively influence, positively touch other people's lives, make meaningful contribution to the development of your neighborhood, of your community, of your country, of your region of the world is increased when you have academic qualifications. So in a nutshell, that's why we need academic excellence. And that's why we have bothered to have this session here today. Right, I think this is self-explanatory, pretty clear. So let me move on. Some key terms and concepts. Number one, motivation. We say this session is about motivating your child to achieve academic excellence, but what is motivation? We look at motivation as an inner force that compels action. Inner force, meaning that we're not looking at you holding a shamu and saying to your child, you study or else I'm gonna whip your backside, right? Which we don't approve of, as you already know. But that is not the motivation we are talking. We are talking of a situation where the child feels pushed from within. There is drive within the child. And that drive is translated into action. For example, getting the child, having the child actually study because the child feels, I would like to study. I choose to study. I'm making a decision to study. That is the inner force we're talking about. I hope you're clear on our definition of motivation. A key concept is self-drive. We want our children to have self-drive, where they self-start, self-assess, self-correct. Self-start, self-assess, self-correct. That's part of nurturing independence in your child. And it's never too early to start encouraging them. Obviously, depending on their age, there's a, there, are, there are various levels of demonstrating self-drive. So perhaps uh, a toddler might demonstrate self-drive uh, by, I don't know, arranging their toys nicely in their room. Uh, a grade one, grade two, uh, up to grade three might demonstrate self-drive by maybe washing their own socks on their own, uh, you know, so there are different levels of self-drive depending on the age. But we are saying when someone is motivated, we expect a certain level demonstration of self-drive. And then another concept we believe in strongly is nurturing a positive environment. We believe your children will excel, will unfurl, will scale to new heights of achievement when the environment is characterized by the three A's, where there's appreciation, when, when they do well, it is noticed and it is mentioned. Right? You notice and name it. Where you pay attention to the child, you are aware you've got your finger on the pulse of how the child is ticking. Are they in a good mood? Is anything bothering them? Are they you know, being naughty? But you are paying attention. And where there's affection, a child is not in doubt at any point that my parents love me and they love me unconditionally. That is affection. Not where love is used as a tool or as a weapon to manipulate and say, if you do this, then I really love you. If you do this, I don't love you. That is not creating a positive environment. And that doesn't work well for your child to achieve excellence in academia as well as in other areas. <clears throat> Number four, we strongly believe in positive reinforcement. We believe if your child does something well and you praise them, it is a greater motivator or motivational factor than when your child does wrong and you criticize them. So if your child doesn't make their bed and say, listen, you're a bad child. You need to make your bed. This is untidy. Is this room a pigsty or a room? At this rate, you'll end up failing to find somebody to marry you when you grow up and you'll die miserable and single. We believe if your child one day, for whatever reason, maybe because of your encouragement, they get up and they make their bed and you say, wow, I'm so proud of you. This is amazing. And you call your spouse and say, hey, Mommy, come, come and see what Jimmy has done today. He's made his bed. Can you believe it? Let's give him a big round of applause. Let's give him a hug. Give me a high five. You know what, Jimmy? I'm so proud of you. Today, I'm going to give you something special. Um, let's see. What is your favorite type of candy? What's favorite sweet you want? Just making that fuss will 
increases the probability that little Jimmy will make his bed tomorrow. So positive reinforcement. You catch your children doing the right things and you praise them for it. It's something we need a reminder as parents because we were never brought up that way. I would say there is 90% chance that every single one of you had parents who were more critical than appreciated. And hence, you don't know any better and it's a struggle. Obviously, Coach Safazwe has been helping us to learn that. So those of you who have been attending the sessions regularly, I'm sure you're well on the path to being a positive parent. But we need constant reminders because it's very easy to relapse into the familiar territory of how we were brought up. Number five is having boundaries. I strongly believe in setting boundaries. Children must know in this homestead, what are the do's and don'ts? Have a few do's and don'ts that you enforce. Boundaries, it's not just about talking about it. It's about enforcing it. And when you enforce it, enforce it consistently, not some of the time, not that child something does something wrong because you're in a happy mood, you don't correct them. You don't waste teachable moments, you correct them. The fact that we're using positive reinforcement doesn't mean we ignore what is wrong. No, that's irresponsible and that leads to spoiled children. But we are simply saying using a whip as a means of correcting is not very effective. Using a belt is not very effective. And in fact, in some cases can lead to serious harm, to serious damage uh, to your children's development. So set boundaries. Uh, in some cases, we talk about ground rules, having a set of ground rules and every children have a stake in the ground rules, consult with them and say, you know what, I want to come up with 10 ground rules whereby I will uh, appreciate it and possibly give you random um, rewards when you comply with the ground rules, when there's evidence you are complying. And when you're not, we also have consequences or repercussions. Uh, I mean, at the very least, I'll correct you, but in some cases, it might mean uh, getting punished, maybe uh, withdrawal of certain privileges that you enjoy, something like that. But having boundaries that are clearly articulated and ones that possibly your children contributed towards formulating and that are consistently reinforced, adhered to, is of critical importance if your child is going to excel in any area in life. Number six concept is consistency. Consistency means that you are doing things in a manner that is predictable. In other words, they know when I do this, this is the consequence. When I do this, this is the consequence. All too often, we link our reaction to children, to our emotions. So because I'm in a happy mood, ah, it's fine, it's okay, he can get away with this. Or because I'm really sad, I will not notice whatever is doing well. So we need to be consistent in, in what we reinforce and in what we discourage and in what we correct. Right, lastly, in parenthood, you don't get what you expect. <laughs> you get what you inspect and reward or correct. I've just typed that in the Zoom chat. In parenthood, you don't get what you expect. You get what you inspect and reward or correct. There is a direct correlation between what you inspect and reward or correct and what your children end up mastering, becoming, developing. So in parenthood, you don't get what you expect. You get what you inspect and reward or correct. I'll pause at this point because these concepts are very important. They are the key pillars of our approach, of our methodology, of our model. I want to hear from you. The first question I've got is just type a number. Out of those seven, you can type either in the WhatsApp group or here in Zoom chat. Which one of those seven resonates with you strongly? The one you can say you really adhere to as much as possible. Which one would you say you really adhere to as much as possible? Just type a number, either here in Zoom or in WhatsApp. Which one of the seven uh, that I've 
pointed out, do you, do you respond to them? Do you, do you resonate with strongly? Uh, right, Faith says boundaries. Thank you, Faith. Elizabeth says four, which is positive reinforcement. Thank you, Elizabeth. And uh, let's see, what else? Christabel says five, which is boundaries, same as Faith. Right, I'm waiting to hear from, from others. Uh, let's see, who else? Ratizzo says five, which is boundaries. Uh, Pauline says four, which is positive reinforcement. Uh, awesome. Tapiwa says four, that's also positive reinforcement, right? Teach says five. So four and five seem to resonate significantly with, with most of us, right? Um, right, let me just see if there are more responses coming. Uh, right, uh, let me check in the WhatsApp. Just give me a moment, right? Uh, teach says network problem on my side. I'm sorry to hear that. Oh, Teach, you've joined, fantastic. I just seen your message here where you said network problems on my side. That was what, 16 minutes ago. I'm glad you managed to join. That's a five. So, right, you have just shared with me the ones that you resonate with. Which one do you think you need to develop? Out of those, which one do you say you're weakest in or you need to develop at the most? Just, just give me a number. One that you say, you know what, this one challenges me. I need to put more effort in this one. Which one of those seven concepts would you say uh, really challenges you? I know number one and two, they're more like definitions, but uh, they're important. Christabel says self-drive. So Christabel, you're looking at developing that self-drive in your child, right? Uh, faith says positive environment, the triple A's, appreciation, attention, and affection, okay? Uh, let's hear from the others. Waiting to hear from you. Please share with us, give us a number. Elizabeth says seven, in parenthood, you don't get what you expect. So that idea of inspecting or checking and giving feedback, it's extremely important, ladies and gentlemen, because today our children are exposed to vast sources of information and disinformation that were not open to us when we were raised. Tapiwa says seven, in parenthood, you don't get what you expect. You get what you inspect and reward or Correct. Precious, your hand is up. Please unmute and talk to us. Precious, I notice your hand is up. Please unmute and talk to us. Okay, for me, it's appreciation. Mm. Appreciation challenges you. Mm -hmm. So you really need to make it a point because appreciation is very, very important. Uh, if you remember in the slides before this one, I also talked about it. So it forms a very, very important foundation upon which most of these concepts are built. Uh, right, the says three positive environments, appreciation, attention, and affection. So based on this, you can already start to see where you need to go with this. Let me move on, and then I'll put you in breakaway groups and you'll carry out some discussion, and then we'll come back and conclude. So having said this, there is a model that I developed, and this model was primarily based on observing uh, my first three children and seeing how they are motivated. <clears throat> so I call it the triple P model. The first P is purpose. One of our children is purpose-driven. A purpose-driven person is focused on a goal. Now, let me give you some background to this child. She grew up as a, what can I say, as an academically challenged child relative to her two older siblings. So she's the third. The first and the second were high flyers from the word go, from grade one, from preschool. They were just high flyers, you know, uh, seen as being among the best performers in their class. Now, this child, struggled and had absolutely no interest. The first two were voracious readers or are voracious readers. They'll get a book and they'll read and, and you know, they'll summarize it. They'll tell you what's in the story. They, they don't even need to be pushed to do that. You have to say to them, hey, put that book down and come and do some work. Now this child, the third child was not like that. Right up to grade seven, oh, she performed okay averagely, but she wasn't a high flyer. And then I don't know what happened. At some point in form one, things changed. Suddenly, totally changed. 
she became so focused on performing well that she could go the whole night studying. She would put herself under so much pressure. It was amazing. And when I analyzed it, I came to the point, conclusion that this child is purpose driven. She is not excited about what she's doing, but she just has a goal that she'll say, I'll achieve this goal, whatever it takes. And so her level of um, perseverance is amazing. The sheer effort that she puts is, is impressive. That's a purpose-driven person. A purpose-driven person is driven by the end goal. And the end goal, I think initially was that, you know what? Everybody in this family thinks I'm, I, I, I'm the academically challenged. I'm going to show these people what I'm made of. I'm going to show them. And she just has this goal in front of her, and she attacks it. Right now, she is writing at all levels. She's just started writing at Cambridge all levels. And uh, that same purpose-driven approach is, 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 is uh, providing fuel to a fire. So that's the first P, it's purpose-driven. Now, it's possible that, I mean, not, not possible, but every person has got a little bit of each of these in them. But I'm interested in what is the, what is the predominant one of these three Ps? Passion, right? Our second child is driven by passion. When she gets involved in a task that she's fascinated by, that she's excited about, she is unstoppable. And that unstoppability only happens as long as she is excited. So she's an excitable person. You know, she will get to talk nonstop about whatever new concept she has is, she is discovered. She will research on it on her own. She will Google about it. She will write about it. She will talk. She will actually become an evangelist on a concept that she's fascinated about. But that fascination doesn't always last, right? And that fire that burns in her can burn out when she loses interest. So that's a passion-driven person. They thrive on excitement. They are excitable and they will move mountains as long as they are still excited about the task. The third, and this is our first boy, he's a boy. He's a pragmatic person. He is not easily excitable. He's the kind of kid you say, which, which, which subject do you enjoy the most? Like, eh, you know, eh, they kind of, all of them are okay, really. Eh. Yeah, I don't know, maybe math, maybe English, maybe not. You know, and I'm like, no, man, pick something. You are young. You, you, you're supposed to be excited. He ain't excited. He's not too driven by the end goal. He will not put the effort that our purpose-driven daughter puts into his work. But he is pragmatic. He reasons things out. He uses logic, cold logic. If I don't pass... This, I will not be able, let's say it's all level, I'll not be able to proceed to A level and I might not do the subject that I want. So I'll study, not because I want to excel and get high grades, but I want to pass and get in and do this. So a pragmatic person is somebody who is logical, who can see the consequences and does what they have to do by virtue of the consequences. The drawback is that with a pragmatic person, or let, let me start with the advantages. The advantages is, Unlike the passion-driven person, he is not going to run out of steam because he's no longer passionate about the task. No, he will do it. Pleasant or unpleasant, as long as it's gonna lead him to his end goal, to his end result. Uh, he's likely to be the most consistent of the three uh, because you know, unlike our first, the first example I shared with you of that purpose-driven person, before he was clear on the purpose, she really was, was acting almost like a slow learner, right? But the pragmatic person can be very consistent. Of the three, I found they can be really, really consistent. And he won't push himself uh, to a breaking point like the purpose-driven person will, where she will spend the whole night uh, awake to study because of this and that. But slow and steady, and he does enough <laughs> and no more. 
So those are the, uh, the three Ps uh, that I came up with. And to my surprise, when I started sharing this model, a lot of people could identify with it, could say, hey, I'm actually a purpose-driven person. Hey, I'm a passion-driven person. Hey, I'm a pragmatist, right? So my question to you right now is looking at the three, which one are you predominantly? Please type a number in the chat. One, two, or three. Which one of the three resonates with you the strongest? Please type a number. Right, I'm waiting. You can type a number in the WhatsApp group or here in, in Zoom chat. Please type a number. If you are unable to type, you can raise your hand and speak. All right, the numbers have started coming in. Uh, Faith say two. That is passion driven. Christabel says one, purpose driven. Elizabeth says three. That's a good distribution. The first three people responded and we've got an even distribution. Right. Pauline says one, it's purpose driven. Ratito says, uh, Precious says one. Uh, Ratito says one. So we have a lot of purpose driven people here. Those are the people who, who will persevere, who can use sheer effort in order for them to achieve what they want to achieve. Uh, let me see in the. What's up, group? I don't see, uh, I don't see uh, anything else coming out there. Tapiwa says one. So predominantly, we've got ones. Uh, we've got a, a two, and we've also got a three. So having said that, I want to hear from two of you. Thinking about your children. Uh, this time, I want you to speak, right? I want to hear your voices. Pick one of your children and tell me which one of the three do you think applies to them. Who would like to share with us? Anybody who would like to speak? You can just unmute and speak since no one is speaking. Or alternatively, you can raise your hand. Precious, your hand is up, but I think it's an old hand. It was up from way back. But since it's already up, why don't you unmute and tell us? If you go more than one child, please share with us one of the children. Hold, hold the line. Just give me a moment. There's a knock on my door. I need to go and attend to it. Right, sorry about that, good people. There was an emergency I needed to attend to. So I wanna hear from two people, any two people. What would you say your child is? P for purpose or passion or pragma, pra, pragma, pragmatic? Elizabeth, your hand is up, please unmute, talk to us. Go ahead, Elizabeth. I've got two children, mm -hmm. uh, Beth, she's a passion driven. She, when she gets excited or interested in something, that's what she does. And Tadiwa is both purpose and passion. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much for sharing that. Appreciate it. Let's hear from one of the parents. Anybody else wants to share quickly? We're running out of time. You can just unmute and speak since no one is speaking. I'll pause. Uh Okay, I've got three children and they are all passion driven. Really? Hey, how about you, Precious? Me, I'm purpose driven. You're purpose driven. Interesting combination. All right. Fantastic. <laughs> okay. So let me share. Please get a note, uh, take notes for this because this is important. Now that you've identified uh, the source of motivation of your child. So to motivate a purpose driven child, you need to focus on the goal. Help your child to clarify their goal. The clearer the goal is, the more motivated they are. So those goals must be progressive. So yes, they might have an end goal that I want to be a doctor, but have a goal at all levels. What is your goal? And make it precise. 
Would you want, what, how many A's are you aiming for? And if possible, have that goal written down, typed, printed, laminated, put on the wall and constantly go back to it. This is how you motivate a purpose-driven child. You're focusing on the goal. If they've got a task to do, do what is, uh, what is recommended by Dr. Stephen Covey in the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Start with the end in mind, begin with the end. Let them see that end picture of what they want to achieve, right? So that's a purpose-driven child. How do you motivate a passion-driven child? With a passion-driven child, you really need to tap in to their passion. Find what they're passionate about. It's very difficult for a passion-driven person to develop passion for an area that they are not naturally passionate about. So you're more likely to succeed when you direct them, when you give them guidelines to channel their efforts in an area that they already naturally passionate about. You want to add fuel to their fire. So find ways of consistently reinforcing stimulus for reinforcing that fire. The stimulus could be a uh, little, I don't know, uh, little clips perhaps from TikTok, from WhatsApp that will reinforce a concept, maybe a subject that they're interested in, maybe websites that you come across, maybe events that you've read about in the news, but they need that constant stimulus in order to maintain and add fuel to their, to their excitement. So that's how you deal with a passion-driven child. You find what they're passionate about and you make sure you're aligning that passion or the activities, their interests towards what they're naturally inclined towards. And then you add stimulus, various stimuli to keep that child engaged, interested, and listen to them as well. Normally, passionate children like to talk about what they are excited about at the moment and make sure you encourage that excitement and channel it. Uh, into something productive. Uh, finally, the pragmatist. Uh, with a pragmatic child, you want to be logical. Uh, I found out with some of them, they actually get somewhat insulted when you try some of the common motivational techniques uh, for excite, excited people. They're just not excited about things that way. So they like logic. They like reasoning where you are saying this will lead to this, or even a conversation where you tap into their thinking. Say, all right, look, uh, I noticed that uh, uh, you have not been uh, you know, studying as, as frequently and as regularly as you were doing you know, maybe last term. And I was wondering, you know, what are the factors? You know? And they explain and you say, well, you know, if uh, you continue this rate of studying, especially given the marks you have been getting of late in your quizzes and revision tests, what do you think is likely to be the result? So you're tapping into their logic once again, right? So they look at it and then maybe they, they can unpack it. And if you feel they're not being logical, you reason with them in terms of logic and say, no, actually, you know what? Most results that people get in an exam are really determined by uh, their average mark of what they've been getting. So I hear you saying you think you'll get an A, but if we just look at the pattern you're doing, it's unlikely. No, but appeal to the logic and then ask them to say, you know, what do you think you could do uh, to change this? You know, if, if we are to change uh, the average you've been getting and we don't want that to be your exam results at the end of the year, what do you think you could change? You know, so you are using reasoning and you're also using questioning to get them to figure out what exactly they want uh, out, out, of, out of the situation. So that is how you motivate a purpose-driven, a passion-driven, and a pragmatic child. Uh, I wanted to put you in a breakaway group and get you to discuss this a bit further, but uh, looking at the time, that is not going to be possible. So what I'll do right now is I'll just open the discussion so that I, you have questions and answers with comments, but this is your time now. I've explained what I had to explain. I want to hear from you. Feedback, comments, questions, you name it, it's entirely up to you. Let's actually do a round, right? Let's ask each person to speak one by one. So let me start with you, Precious. 
Precious, please unmute. Comment, question, reflection, feedback, it's entirely up to you. This is your moment, Precious. Please unmute and talk to me. Okay. Um, I think this was very informative for me. It was very informative and I am thinking and pondering on how to, how to encourage my passion driven kids. Feed, in summary, I'll just say feed fuel to their fire. You get that? Feed fuel mm -hmm. to their fire. Find, first of all, identify the area where they are naturally, where their passion naturally lies. And make sure you know you, you encourage those subjects that will ride on that passion. Because unlike a purpose-driven or a pragmatic person who can uh, put effort where they have no interest, a passion-driven person struggles to do something they're not interested in. So once you have identified that, find try and find stimulus, different ways of feeding that fire, little interesting things, tidbits general knowledge things, events that are happening, news, internet, links, anything that you can find that will add more fuel to that fire. Okay, all right, but I, okay, can I add more? No problem, go ahead. Okay, so like you said, uh, our children are exposed to a lot of misinformation and disinformation. Mm -hmm. I think that our children are misinformed at some point in, in life Mm -hmm. And even when they appear to be passionate about something, I think they will change after some time. So that part is tricky for me. I'll share a little bit about my children. The first daughter, she was passionate about things to do with the uh, history and the other subjects, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So at all level, I would wake her up to, we stay in Norton and mm -hmm. we drive to school every morning. So mm -hmm. I would say, you be the first one to wake up. But before we leave, can you put in one hour to study? Okay. Then mm -hmm. she would wake up and she would be there at the table. And on our way out, I would ask her, what did you study about today? I would like for you to, to do some meds every day because of the results that she was getting in meds. Mm -hmm. Then she would not do meds. She would do the art subjects and the, she would do a lot of those every day. And guess what? She got A's in the subjects that she put effort in mm. and she failed, she failed maths. Mm. Mm. I and hear and you. we went and we went on and we did uh we did uh, the A levels. It was the same story. You push, you feel like you're the one that's going to school. You push, you push, but because they are passionate about the certain area or they think that's what they want they put more effort that side. But after some time, I feel that they lose the, the, the passion. I don't know, what can you, yeah. how can you help me? Well, tell, tell you what, we're dealing with human beings. So we don't have a, 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 a mathematically precise formula. All we can talk about are generalities and probabilities that generally speaking, this is what happens. It is quite possible for a child to lose passion in a set or interest in a certain area. That's part of growing up in maturity. I can tell you, uh, throughout primary school, our second child, the one who's passion driven, wanted to be a doctor. She wanted to be a doctor. She read a book called Gifted Hands and she wanted to be a doctor. And we were convinced she would be a doctor. In high school, mm -hmm. she couldn't stand the sight of blood. <laughs> mm -hmm. And she mm -hmm. had to say, No, uh, actually, Dad, I'm sorry to disappoint you. I won't be a doctor. She said, You're not disappointing me. This is, this is who you are. And you are allowed to change. You know? You're allowed mm -hmm. to change. So now she's interested in something totally different. She's at university now. But um, I think move with it, go with it. You can never become a lesser person by what you learn. So whatever they had learned uh, through, you know, some people say university doesn't teach you the degree you're getting. It teaches you how to learn as an adult. It teaches you lifelong learning. And it's kind of mm -hmm. the same with these children. If they're passionate about something and they are learning how to learn what they're passionate about, even if that passion changes, the ability to learn will still remain. So that's fine. Mm -hmm. But what you have said supports exactly what I was telling you about passion-driven people. It's very difficult mm -hmm. for them to bring themselves to do things that they're not passionate about. It's painful for them. That's why we need to tap into that passion. 
but at the same time, encourage some level of balance because it's still, you know, it's good to have at least all level maths, but um, I can identify with what you're saying. All right, in the interest of time, let's move on to the others. Remember, you can always get me after this. Uh, you can get me in the WhatsApp group. It's a temporary WhatsApp group we've set up, but we will, we will, we will uh, uh, use it for maybe the next couple of days. Um, I'm sorry, parents, I wanted to finish at exactly eight, but uh, I haven't managed the time very well. So if you, with your permission, we'll go up to 10 past eight, provided you're also brief in your comments. So we're gonna hear from Christabel, followed by Elizabeth, followed by Pauline, followed by Ratizzo, followed by Tapiwa, and then Teach in that order. So I'm just saying this so that you are ready. Christabel, over to you. Question, comment, reflection, feedback, it's up to you. Please talk to us. Yeah, it's quite interesting. Um, I think I need to work on the nurturing a positive environment part. Mm. Yeah, appreciation, attention, affection, learning to balance it. You know, with many kids, sometimes you tend to over, uh, over like appreciate one more than the other, mm. maybe because uh, one may be more difficult, uh, you know, and other one is easy. So it's easy to, to love the easy one. Not that you don't love them, but it's easy to you know to be kinder to that one who's, yeah. you know, then the other one feels as if they obviously feel as if, oh, I'm not the favorite one, I'm not loved. So yeah, I need to work on that. That's very Thanks so much, Christabel, because you know, right now there are many adults I've dealt with who have scars from childhood who say so and so is the favorite or was the favorite. So we really need to make a superhuman effort because naturally as human beings, we just tend to be closer to certain children than to others. But I've seen the harm it can do to children, to their self-esteem. You find an adult who is still trapped in that childhood experience. And when it matters most, you can find their confidence failing them and you can trace it back to that event. And some don't even know that this is what's maybe messing them up psychologically. Thanks, Christabel. Elizabeth, over to you. Hi. Hey, go ahead. Hello. Hello, please, we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. I just wanted to say this program was very informative and educative. Uh, you do not get what you expect as a parent. I expected a lot from my children, but I didn't get that. Thank you. You get what you inspect and reward or correct to complete it. All right, thanks, Elizabeth. Let's hear from Pauline. Uh, thank you, Coach. Welcome. Hello. Go ahead. Yeah. Yes, um, it got me uh, to reflect on um, how I was doing it all along. Uh, especially the number number seven that um, a parent we don't as parents we don't get what we expect but what we inspect and um, reward and uh, the other one is what correct correct yes uh, it's quite a challenge it's an ongoing um, process that we keep doing so that we get the results that we look forward to. Uh, as far as the triple P module is concerned, I was uh, when I looked at it, I just smiled. Eh? Uh, my son is uh, a purpose and pragmatic mm. son. Mm. My girls, all my girls are purpose and passion driven. You can mm. see depending with the circumstances. Mm. Mm. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thanks for that reflection. Appreciate it. Ratizzo, over to you. Please unmute. Talk to us. Yes, um, I find that, you know, on positive reinforcement, that one, I, I resonated with one, the speaker before, you know, could the easy one, you know, you tend to get along more, and then the one who requires a bit more work. And then on the triple P model, it was more like, we'd find that there's one who's passionate, is passionate about the things, the things he's passionate about are the things that he would do, and everything else which may be purposeful per se, he will not mm -hmm. do. So yeah, I think um, 
we have to employ some tactics to make him a bit more, you know, to see the purpose in the academics as well, not just in the sport. Mm -hmm. And you, you may use, you know, multiple approaches there, even also using the logical approach to get him to see uh, the pragmatism of balancing your academics, your sporting with your academics, because you've got a limited uh, period when you are when you are useful in sport, you know, your cell by date, depending on the sport in question. And then there's also uh, a very high probability that you could be very good at sport, but you won't reach stardom. It's highly competitive. That's why we have only one Lionel Messi in the world and only one uh, Ronaldo. Uh, yes, there are many, many, many who played soccer with them and many who ended up not achieving even a quarter of that. So I think it's important to, to keep reminding him and also finding a way of uh, maybe combining that sport with some of the academics. They could maybe do some uh, degree related to, to sport, right? So they'll find it more interesting than say a degree that has absolutely nothing to do with their passion. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, let's move on next. I think it's Tapiwa. Over to you, Tapiwa. Please unmute. Talk to us. Thank you very much, Mr. Mungoshi. Um, I have three daughters, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, I have uh, 11 years old, nine years old, and the other one is uh, three years old. Mm -hmm. They are all girls. And then uh, the first one is Moisha. She is a purpose-driven kid. And then uh, that's Kayla. And then the other one is passion-driven. That's Moisha, the first one. That's my first daughter. Um, when it comes to uh, she is that uh, kind of a kid who loves dancing on, on internet. And she found uh, a dance teacher and she said, Mama, you know what? I love dancing. And if it's okay with you, please, uh, on my weekends, would you take me to the dance teacher? And after that, I'll come home and do my box. If you want me to pass, you have to find me a dance teacher. So I don't know if it's a good idea or it's a bad idea for her to be finding a, a dance teacher at her age. She's in grade five. And uh, from grade one to grade four, she used to be a very excellent kid in terms of schoolwork. And then from since this year, grade five, she's been like acting up in terms of schoolwork. All right, great. It's fine. Is it because of her dancing or... or it could be a number of factors and uh, COVID didn't make it any easier either. Uh, most children struggle <laughs> and parents okay. and teachers, but here is my quick advice. Uh, I would like you to mm -hmm. link, I, I recommend, I mean, you can take it or leave it. I want you to link mm -hmm. time to academic responsibilities. So okay. in you are not going to go dancing until you finish your homework. And I've checked it. And it's been done. Okay. Uh, this sounds like manipulation and the threat, but I think it's well within a parent's responsibility to do that, especially grade five, because some of these techniques work at a younger age, but not so much for teenagers. Yes. So I think you can say, look, I love the dancing, but I want you to do well in your academics. You set a bar a standard from grade one up to four, uh, I would like you to reach that level. We can, we can take it step by step, but uh, if by the end of the year, you have not reached at least this level of performance, <coughs> uh, we will consider mm -hmm. uh, stopping the, the dancing lessons until you reach this level. Sometimes we need tough love as parents. Does that make sense, Tapio? It does. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Last but not least, Teach, over to you. Thank you very much. Teach.
Hello. Yes, I can hear you. Please go ahead. Teach, you have muted yourself. You unmuted, said hello, and then you muted back. Please unmute and talk to us. Your microphone is muted. Yes, it's unmuted now. Please speak. We can hear you if you speak. Right. Thanks, Coach. I think uh, I had a problem in my network this side. Okay. But apparently, what I've actually learned from this, um, I'm supposed to motivate my children here and there. I think that's the starting point. Okay. Yes, that's what I actually have learned. I think starting point, if I motivate them, then I don't think there's any problem from motivating, then the rest will follow. Okay, great. Fantastic. So since your network has been giving you problems, I strongly recommend that you listen or watch the video clip. We should send it by tomorrow. It's just processing now. We might even send it tonight, uh, later on tonight. So please make sure you go through it. Thank you very much, parents. This has been fantastic. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, two things I'm going to ask for one in one minute right now, I would like you to just type in one word, how would you summarize this session, please type in the chat in one word, what would be your summary of this session, uh, just summarize it in one word. And then secondly, I'll ask somebody to give us a closing prayer, anybody a volunteer to give us a closing prayer, but let's have you type first and then I'll ask for the prayer afterwards, please just type one word, enlighten, thank you Christabel. Educative, that's Tapiwa. Thanks, Tapiwa. Appreciate it. Informative, thank you, Elizabeth. Informative, thank you, Precious. Educative, thanks, Teach. Appreciate it. Okay, right. Uh, who would like to? Oh, we, Wise Nuggets, insightful. Thank you, Ratizo. Wow. <laughs> Thank you, Ratizo. Profound. That's Pauline. Thank you very much. Greatly appreciated. Right. Who would like to give us a closing prayer? Anybody? All right, no volunteer. Let me ask Tafazwa since he's been awfully quiet. Coach Tafazwa, please give us a closing prayer. All right, um, <clears throat> let's, let's pray. Father, I thank you for the session that we've just had. And I thank you for all the parents who've participated. I now pray for your wisdom and the inspiration of the spirit to help each and every one of them to implement what they have learned. And I pray that they will be led to success by your wisdom and by your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, Thank you everybody. It's been amen. wonderful. And we will post the video once it's ready. We'll actually upload the video onto YouTube and then I'll send you the link. Thanks once again. Take care. God bless you. Thank, Thank you. you. God bless you too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.